With EPCOR as our principal sponsor, we have been working with communities, uh, watershed groups, research institutions, municipal and provincial governments, and international organizations to raise the profile of water issues in this country and abroad. And as was noted, we have three principal goals. The first is to dispel the myth of limitless abundance of water in Canada. We aim also, as Mayor Mandel said, to translate water and climate research uh, into language the average person can understand and that decision makers can use to craft a uh, timely and durable public policy as it relates to water management. And finally, and I think this is quite important, uh, we exist to bring international example to bear positively on Canadian water issues and I hope to advance all three of these goals today. Because of our international connections, I'm often invited to report back to Canada from the front lines of the global water crisis. And I'd like to begin, if I may, by putting the global water crisis within uh, the larger context of the major issues of our time. And it was uh, quite significant that the organization that Mayor Mandel uh, pointed it to, the Interaction Council, I recently held a meeting in China in which some 25 former heads of state offered their views on the current state of the world and what ought to be done about it. And as I will explain, the global water crisis figured largely in this discussion. This group of elder statesmen, which is comprised of many of the most prominent political leaders of our generation, made it clear that we live in troubled times and we have other far more immediate problems than water. And certainly that's true in this country, or so it would seem. First and foremost among the world's immediate difficulties is the global economic crisis, which this group unanimously attributed to weak regulation, the irrespons irresponsible fiscal policies of government, and to the greed of the global financial community for which it has yet to either apologize or atone. So you can see from these comments, they get right at the issues. Everybody evidently saw the risk of subprime mortgages and other derivatives, but nobody wanted to stop making money from them. And it was noted that if not effectively addressed, the global economic collapse could be the end of a unified Europe. Youth unemployment, it was noted, was over 50% in some of these European countries. And should the masses of unemployed youth find a compelling demagogue, it could be a different kind of Arab Spring in Greece, Spain, and Portugal. And the fear that was expressed is that pessimism among a lost generation of youth may cascade to depths where even the greedy aren't winners. Also, it was pointed out that there is the problem of the Middle East and uh, the relationship in that area between the Palestinian situation and the one and a half billion Muslims that live in 57 surrounding Muslim states. Water there is also an issue, so stay tuned. Our world is also threatened by nuclear proliferation in regions not wholly controlled by governments where lawlessness associated with drug cartels and political dissidents is rampant. The $1.1 billion annual trade in small arms is now responsible for the deaths of 350,000 innocent people each year. This too is a global issue. For the first time, however, water security is now in the top five on the former world leaders' lists of global concerns. Meeting the drinking water and sanitation needs of the world's unserved remains a difficult challenge, as does maintenance of the world's already existing water infrastructure. Even in nations with relatively abundant water supplies, surface water pollution, groundwater overdraft, and adequate availability of water to nature are becoming serious problems. And so are the harmful effects of intensified agricultural production, which is uh, necessary, of course, to feed our swelling populations. As with the case of subprime mortgages, it was noted that the risk of carrying on uh, business as usual with respect to water is clear to everyone, but just as with that crisis, no one wants to be the first to initiate difficult and unpopular reforms. Finally, increasingly violent weather events have also become a problem globally. There is deep concern that climate change will complicate all of these problems. Now, while it remains difficult to precisely distinguish what we as people are causing from natural variability, we know that even without global warming, 
the activities of our large and growing human population are already affecting our planet's delicate land, life, water, weather, climate interface. These effects are of a magnitude globally that suggests that adaptation is no longer an option. These reports from the rest of the world remind us that the situation to which we must adapt to assure water and climate security in Alberta is in essence very little different from the situations that others face globally. The situation to which we must adapt is first and foremostly ecological in origin. We have changed our landscapes in many regions of the world, in some places quite dramatically. Secondly, the situation to which we must adapt is in part hydrological, in that by changing the land and withdrawing more water for our purposes, we have altered both surface flows and groundwater recharge. At the same time, we're leaving less water for nature to use, and in so doing, we've reduced the amount of water nature has for its purposes and how much it can purify and supply for our own use. And this has had a negative effect on water quality almost everywhere in the world. Finally, our situation is climatic because if you alter the land and change its hydrology, the climate invariably changes. Civilizations before ours learned this the hard way. In our time, we've learned that if, on top of these effects, you add more of certain substances that already compose it to the atmosphere, such as carbon dioxide and methane, then eco-hydro-climatic change accelerates, and that appears to be what is happening. So let's look at how this all works here in the Canadian West. And I say Canadian West because the boundaries around Alberta are meaningless in hydroclimatic terms. We are part of a larger West, so let's begin with ecological change, because it forms the upper headwater reaches of major rivers in the West, which influences a, to a great deal what happens downstream. What we do here in Alberta matters to our neighbors. Since Alberta has become a province in 1905, its landscape has been dramatically altered. Dr. Brad Stelfox has demonstrated that in over just a century in Alberta alone, we have turned 11 million hectares of the Great Plains into cultivated cropland. We have transformed 14 million hectares of the province into livestock grazing lands, 24 million hectares of Alberta's forests into forest managed areas, and paved 225,000 hectares under cities and towns. And another 340,000 hectares have been transformed into rural residential areas, or, or what we here in Alberta call acreages. An additional million hectares have been developed by the energy sector for seismic lines, well sites, pipelines, and processing plants. Our roads and railroads occupy another 400,000 hectares for transportation, and 30,000 hectares have been sacrificed for recreation. So not counting for multiple use, the total human activity in Alberta now counts for somewhere around 50 million hectares. And this land use is not passive. As Dr. Brad Stelfox has pointed out, Alberta is definitely firing on all land use cylinders. Each year it produces up to 2 million head of cattle, 3 million head of swine, 120 million kilograms of poultry, and 35 million tons of field crops. Alberta also produces up to 25 million cubic meters of timber, 160 million cubic meters of natural gas, 35 million cubic meters of conventional oil, 80 million cubic meters of bitumen, 35 million tons of coal, and between 1,200 and 1,500 petajoules of electricity. That's a lot of productivity. And it will come to no surprise to anyone that such massive land use changes in combination with resource production on this scale are having an impact on the province's water. Alberta's growing water woes include reduction in surface flows, particularly in small streams and ponds, reductions in main stem river flow and aquifer volume, and all of these things together are reflected in a general deterioration of water quality. Finally, the situation to which we must adapt is climatic, because if you alter the land and change its hydrology, the climate invariably changes. Now what's interesting here, if you look at the science, what we're experiencing at the moment is not climate change in and of itself. That will come. What we're experiencing are the combined early effects of rapid, accelerating, 
and in some cases irreversible eco-hydroclimatic changes. As neighboring Saskatchewan and Manitoba, as well as the states of Minnesota and North Dakota, have been no less transformed by their own land use changes, the impacts that begin in Alberta cascade and multiply as you move downstream in the basin. So Alberta, as you see in this map, is at the top of the million square kilometer Lake Winnipeg Basin. This basin extends over four provinces and four American states in the central Great Plains region of North America. Over the last 20 years, it has been scientifically demonstrated that the increased area of algal blooms, which now cover sometimes 10 to 12,000 square kilometers of the lake, and the growing presence of toxic cyanobacteria in Lake Winnipeg are a warning of larger eco-hydrological problems, not just in the immediate Lake Winnipeg area, but throughout the region. Major spring flooding throughout the region has been increasing in the past decade, setting new records. The floods of last spring in 2011 cost the province of Manitoba a billion dollars. Flood damages in North Dakota and Saskatchewan were in the same range. A recent study shows that a 500-year flood level would cost between 11 and 13 billion dollars in the United States portion of the basin alone. There is growing concern that the cost of persistent ongoing flooding and related damages will in time be substantial enough to make it difficult to sustain prosperity as we know it today. The fear is that the economies of southern Manitoba and areas of the Red River Basin in the United States may ultimately be so damaged by these combined ecological, hydrological, and climatic influences as to impoverish them. So the topic of my presentation today is assuring water and climate security in Alberta, but we can't separate ourselves from our neighbors. On the central Great Plains region as a whole, I don't think we're moving fast enough in the direction of either water or climate security. It occurs to me that what we're largely doing is standing still while the region in which we live is moving toward irreversible eco-hydroclimatic change. To understand why additional human-caused climate warming is such a threat to establish stability, it's important to understand the central role that water plays in our planet's weather and climate system. The fundamental threat that climate change poses relates to what hydrologists call stationarity. And within the broader con hydroclimatic context, stationarity is the notion that there will always be approximately the same amount of water available in any given place or region as we've come to expect. Stationarity implies that seasonal weather and long-term climate fluctuations or conditions will fluctuate predictably within established and predictable limits. What's happening now, we can see, is that increased mean atmospheric temperatures are altering the patterns of movement of water through the global hydrological cycle. This means that the statistics from the past related to how surface, subsurface, and atmospheric water will act under a variety of given conditions are no longer reliable. This, we've recently discovered, is a lot more serious than we at first thought. So let's look first at how loss of hydrologic stationarity or stability is reflected in the volume of and pattern of water supply in Alberta. Through the efforts of the Western Canadian Cryospheric Network, we now know that we may have lost as many as 300 glaciers in the Canadian Rockies since 1920. What is happening to our glaciers, of course, is of great importance to the future water supply and to the future climate of the Canadian West. And while some may argue that glaciers may not be as important in terms of total water supply as they were in the past, glacial recession must be seen in a larger climatic context. We already know that long before warming has finished the reducing the length and depth of our glaciers, that warming will be after our mountain snowpacks. And that could have a huge influence on our water supply. And we're not the only ones noticing these changes. A report entitled Global Change in Extreme Hydrology 
Testing Conventional Wisdom was published by the National Academies of Science in the United States in late 2011. It confirms how serious the loss of hydrologic stationarity could be in North America and around the world if current trends persist. The findings of the National Academies analysis includes consensus on the fact that a human-caused land cover changes such as wetland destruction, deforestation, urban expansion, and the uh, pervasive impact of water engineering in the form of impoundments, irrigation, and diversions have significant impact on the duration and intensity of floods and droughts. The report observes that predictions related to the occurrence of major hydrological extremes are currently based on the notion of stationarity. But observations now demonstrate that stationarity is no longer a valid assumption. And the report concludes, and I quote, that continuing to use the assumption of stationarity in designing water management systems is in fact no longer practical or even defensible. This from the National Academies in the United States. So please consider what this means. We manage water in Canada based on principles of stationarity that imply hydroclimatic stability. That stability no longer exists. And this means that the way we presently manage water in Canada uh, is no longer defensible. What we're seeing here is that the old methods and the old math no longer work. This is one of the reasons forecasters were unable to predict the extent and nature of flooding in Saskatchewan and Manitoba last year. As was pointed out in a review of Lake Diefenbaker operations following the flooding last spring in southern Saskatchewan, forecasters were sometimes overconfident in their predictive capacity. And the reason for this is that they thought they could count on what they knew about hydrology from the past to predict the future. And unfortunately, the future is no longer perfectly contained in the past. So what happened in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and North Dakota in 2011 could be viewed as evidence that warming atmospheric temperatures have already begun to accelerate the global hydrological cycle, which is expected to result in more frequent and more severe floods and droughts widely. The algorithm upon which this assertion rests is one of the very few hydrological parameters that doesn't seem to be changing in relation to all the others as atmospheric temperatures rise. And this algorithm is called the clausius capiron relation. No, I don't want to get too technical here, and, I, and I, I really was careful not to put the formula up, but what's really interesting about this is that formulated in the mid-19th century by a German physicist, Rudolf Clausius, and a French railway engineer, Benoit Clapeyron, the clausius capron relation establishes this one important hydrological principle, that the water holding capacity of the Earth's atmosphere increases by about 7% per degree Celsius, or about 4% per degree Fahrenheit. So you can see that the water holding capacity of the atmosphere would increase 28% of a 4 degree Celsius temperature increase. And quite simply, this means that air holds more water at higher temperatures, which means that as the planet warms, more moisture is available for storm events. The anticipated changes in precipitation inferred by this equation have been confirmed by research findings that have demonstrated that more intense precipitation and more severe worldwide drought has happened uh, in the last 40 to 50 years. Now, we are not the only ones confronted by these changes, and it looks like we're going to have a lot more company in the future. Scientific attention focused on atmospheric dynamics related to climate warming has revealed some very interesting phenomenon that confirm the clausius clapeyron relationship. Researchers have discovered, for example, the presence of what are now called atmospheric rivers, monster conduits of water vapor the size of a hundred Mississippis roaming through the sky looking to deposit huge volumes of water often on the unsuspecting. And we suspect that atmospheric rivers have been around probably for eternity. But now they're overflowing their cloud banks in ways we've never witnessed before, producing floods of the magnitude that we saw in Australia and Pakistan in 2010 and likely in parts of North America last spring. And as we've seen, the effects of widespread flooding are not contained within provincial or national borders, but can affect food and commodity prices globally. 
So we don't as yet have an adequate replacement for stationarity statistics. And until we can find a new way of substantiating appropriate action in the absence of stationarity, risks will become increasingly difficult to predict or to price in Manitoba and elsewhere. We have yet to react to the loss of hydrologic stationarity. The National Academy's report observes that agencies responsible for managing extreme weather events have been provided with only marginally useful scientific information about the likely effects of future climate circumstances on the hydrological cycle. The report argues that in an era in which field monitoring stations could be discontinued based on stationary statistical assumptions, that era is over. We used to feel that we could get rid of our monitoring networks because we had a general sense of what the hydrology was doing. In a non-stationary world, expanded basic monitoring of key elements of the hydrologic cycle is essential to support analysis of hydrological extremes and to be able to predict them with any confidence. The report argues that there are not enough interactions and adequate knowledge exchange between climate scientists, water scientists, engineers, and practitioners to address the challenges associated with loss of stationarity. And the report concludes that we're going to have to figure out how we're going to manage hydrological extremes with or without scientific certainty. And as we've seen in Manitoba, there's some urgency in doing this. We need to recognize that the problem we presently face is in some areas of this country gotten away from us, and science can speak no clearly than this. In the central Great Plains region, we appear to be in harm's way. We need to bring this basin back under our control before it's no longer possible to do so. And the threat here is not just to Manitoba, but to the entire West. So if you care about water and climate security in Alberta, this is a situation in which you, uh, that you may want to watch. And uh, the challenge of this generation, in terms of water and climate security in Manitoba at least, may reside in three overarching goals, which have bearing on how we manage water here in this province. The central Great Plains may have to be re-engineered from a hydrological perspective. We have to develop agricultural systems that are more resilient to extreme weather events. We have to protect the prairie economy and the globally important agricultural future of the West. And that might be the only way we can save Lake Winnipeg and hundreds of similarly affected lakes across the Canadian West, including Alberta. So I want to point out, this isn't the end of the world. I wish you to know that. The sky is not falling. Liquid water, snow, and ice respond directly and visibly and measurably to temperature. So if we follow what's happening to our water, it will tell us what's happening to our climate and how we might adapt to the conditions that we might expect in the future. In Edmonton, you've already started to adapt to feedbacks associated with rapid hydroclimatic change by managing your water more effectively. But be successful over the longer term, Canada really does need a new water ethic. And there's no reason, what I've seen in Edmonton in this area, there's no reason why that ethic couldn't be born here. So in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with a 10-point plan aimed at assuring water and climate security in Alberta now and in the future. First of all, every time the subject of the oil sands comes up, it tends to suck all of the air out of the room. Though they present real water issues that need ongoing attention, the oil sands are not Alberta's only or maybe even most serious water issue. Our focus cannot be diverted from other serious concerns that need our attention. The biggest threat to water and climate security in Alberta is the fact that our hydrology is changing. This means that the statistics related to the historic availability of precipitation, flow volume information in rivers, and the extent of groundwater recharge are no longer reliable, or in some cases even relevant. Established water management practice will not be adequate in the uncertain hydrological circumstances that are emerging. And this suggests that every aspect of current water policy in the province will likely be affected by these changes. 
Groundwater contamination is very costly to remediate if it can be done at all. Once it occurs, it can be permanent, at least in terms of time frames meaningful to those alive today. We must do everything we possibly can to ensure that the groundwater we'll desperately need to augment surface supplies in the future is not contaminated to such an extent that it can't be used for other purposes. Others have made this mistake and wish very much that they had never done so. Uh, the mayor was quite right in saying that you are very, very successful in this city in reducing uh, leaks, etc. But Albertans remain among the most profligate water user, wasters in the world. By reaffirming the 30% water use reduction targets established for each economic sector through Alberta's Water for Life strategy, we can assure there will be enough water available to address issues related to changing hydrological circumstances and to ensure that growing populations have access to the same benefits water provides to us today in the future. New water infrastructure in this province comes into existence largely with the development of new subdivisions, but revenues often do not cover the real cost of maintaining that infrastructure over the long term and replacing it once its lifespan has come to an end. By not charging the real cost of water treatment and distribution, we allow our systems to run down. In those places in which we defer maintenance, we're creating an enormous water infrastructure deficit in this province and a public health threat that our children and grandchildren will inherit. Reform of funding mechanisms, design standards, and asset management pro protocols related to water infrastructure is critical to this province's future. The action on uh, water and climate security in Canada is not happening at the federal level. Where it's happening is at the municipal level, principally in larger cities like yours. Uh, you manage your water supplies very well in Edmonton, and that's why I think you can ex export your local vision and competence elsewhere through EPCOR. But not everybody in the country enjoys uh, such competent water management. In Canada generally, we have accepted and encouraged wasteful water use as a social norm. We have an enormous cost, overbuilt water infrastructure to support that wasteful norm. And now we find we can't afford to maintain and replace all the overbuilt infrastructure that supports that waste, which increases the risk of public health disasters like Walkerton. We've also discovered that we waste enormous amounts of energy treating and moving water to where it can be wasted. And in addition, we've realized that the energy we're wasting by wasting water is accelerating climate change, which is starting to cause enormous damage to the infrastructure we can't afford to maintain and replace. So you can see we've created something of a cycle in this country and on this continent. And by breaking this cycle, there are head-turning economic benefits that can accrue to everyone. Industry examples suggest that for every dollar you save in water use, you can save as much as four dollars more on chemicals, energy, and electricity. So let's get at those savings. In the past 50 years, agriculture has performed a miracle in supplying food for a rapidly growing world population. It has to be recognized, however, that Agricultural productivity has not come without environmental costs, especially with respect to water quality. The effects of agricultural runoff, not just in Canada, but globally, must be better monitored and government must work with the agricultural sector to improve practices so as to prevent a serious crisis that will pit rural areas against cities over matters related to water supply and quality and food security. This is a serious concern and it needs to be clearly thought out and we need to cooperate with one another to succeed. Water markets are being created in Alberta through accidental and not so accidental precedent without the full understanding and support of the public. No government, in my estimation, looking at how others around the world manage their water, should be allowed to lose control of water within its jurisdiction as a result of lack of oversight over licenses granted for the privilege of use. There are a few important things Alberta needs to do long before it even gives markets a thought. Demonstrate that First Nations have not been ignored. 
satisfactorily define the water pricing and conservation measures that will be put into place that will free more water to be generally available for minimum human use and other purposes now in the future and fully describe the actions that in tandem will be taken to measurably reduce the water quality impacts of agricultural practices. Next, develop and codify exactly the practices will be put into a place to assure adequate environmental flows, then illustrate the government structure that will provide appropriate, effective, and timely oversight of the above. And once all these actions are completed, you can decide if you really do need markets at all. As Saskatchewan and Manitoba already know, more frequent and intense extreme weather events are going to be very expensive. And I know this is Alberta and not everyone likes to hear this, but climate change really is a threat. It must be recognized that continued denial of the potential seriousness of climate change effects will stand in the way of timely adaptation and it could hurt Alberta socially, economically and politically. Finally, there are a number of other water-related issues that need to be monitored carefully, especially in the context of the loss of hydrologic stationarity. These include changes in snowpack and snow cover, particularly in mountain headwaters, the effects of airborne pollution on water quality, issues related to contaminants of emerging concern, and the effects of even small concentrations of endocrine-altering substance on human health. What I'm talking about here are all those unspent drugs that are finding their way into water. This includes birth control, erectile, hormonal, and antibiotic substances that are being flushed into our water systems uh, that we have no way to economically treat. All of these emerging issues point to the need for ongoing improvements in water treatment, which reinforces the urgency of implementing conservation measures, reforming water infrastructure funding arrangements, and design and operating protocols. These emerging concerns also put into relief the need for active protection of groundwater quality, improvements in agricultural practices, and careful observation on how our climate changing uh, climate effects will affect the hydrology of this province as the decades pass. But properly managed, I would suggest to you, there is, if we take up the slack and manage our water properly, enough water to meet current and future needs. There's no reason why we can't achieve water and climate security. We know from local experience and international example what we have to do. We have leading edge technology and outstanding science in our universities, and we know how to employ these. As happened widely in the world, however, the failure to keep up with problems we are creating for ourselves with respect to water and climate security in Alberta is not a failure of understanding, but a failure of priority. Recent national polls suggest that Albertans are alone in Canada in holding that oil is our most important natural resource, even more important than water. The fact is that in economic terms of economic and environmental security, water is at least as important as oil. We should be managing and valuing the one with the same fierce attention and due diligence as we manage the other. And until we do, water and climate security will be visible right before our eyes, but always just slightly beyond our grasp. Thank you very much.